hello again, and thank you again for joining our webinar today on the medical review findings and dental service reviews. My name again is Mary Sue Gardner, and I am actually a registered nurse on the Provider Outreach and Education Department at WPS. And I'm joined today by other members of Provider Outreach and Education, as well as Medical Review. Now, some dental services are so integral to other medically necessary services that the clinical success of that service is dependent upon the inextricable linkage to the dental services. For dental services to be inextricably linked to other Medicare covered services, different providers like a doctor and a dentist must coordinate care. And that coordinated care must be to provide Medicare covered services to treat the illness and dental services that are integral to the clinical success of the medical service. Your documentation must contain evidence of care coordination. And this helps support that the services are linked to each other. Without this evidence, we cannot pay claims with dental services. So today we're going to be focusing on some of those medical review findings, and we're going to be discussing ways to avoid um, denials of your services. This is our disclaimer. We have to show this at every event. And this disclaimer basically says this information was prepared in accordance with Medicare laws, rules, and regulations. You as a provider are, um, you must follow Medicare laws, rules, and regulations. And if for any reason, the information I provide today is different tomorrow because Medicare's rules often change, then it's your responsibility as a provider to make sure you're following the laws, rules, and regu regulations that are in effect on that data service. Also, CMS prohibits you as a provider from recording this presentation, um, either audio or video, or taking screenshots for any profit-making purposes. So since we don't know what you would be using it for, we just ask that you don't audio or video or take any screenshots. We are recording for you. And again, it will be on our YouTube site as an encore from today's event. There are a few acronyms that I may say during today's call. And if I use an acronym that you are not familiar with, please just refer back to this page. And mostly the acronyms that I'll throw out today are billing acronyms. So your um, current dental terminology or your current procedural, procedural terminology, hicks, picks, et cetera. All right, my overall objective today is that you learn about what is covered under Medicare regarding dental services and we, by knowing that, you also learn how to avoid medical review denials. I really hope to accomplish this today by reviewing documentation requirements. We're going to highlight some identified billing issues, and we're going to examine the importance of proper coding of the dental services that are provided. Now, on your screen and in your slide deck, if you're following along with the slide deck, which I also forgot to mention, if you um, did not download the presentation, the slide deck for today, you can do so from our live events page. And I see Jennifer already put that link in the chat for you guys. So if you um, want a copy of the slide deck, you're more than welcome to download it from our live events page at WPSGHA.com. Okay, moving on, some definitions. There's a few phrases that are probably used throughout this presentation. And I wanna provide you with the definitions of those phrases. But the key one that we're gonna focus on is the inextricable linkage. This means that 
the service cannot be considered separately. The dental services are, are integral to the clinical outcome and success of the covered medical procedure. As I stated at the start of this webinar, the dental services must be integral to any other medically necessary services so much that the clinical success of that service is dependent upon the dental service. All right, let's move in and start talking about Medicare dental coverage. And we're going to start with inpatient, inpatient hospital dental services. Medicare doesn't pay for item or services in connection with the care, treatment, filling, removal, or replacement of teeth or structures supporting those teeth, except for inpatient hospital services connected to dental service when that patient requires hospitalization because of one of these things on your screen. The patient's underlying medical condition and clinical status and the severity of the dental service being provided. So the dental service payment exclusion, exclusion um, doesn't apply and Medicare can pay under Part A and Part B when those dental services are inextricably linked to the clinical success of the other Medicare covered procedures. So some examples of dental services that could be inextricably linked to and substantially related to um, the clinical uh, success of certain Medicare services. Some of these things include, but this is, it's not limited to um, the things that are on your screen, dental or oral exams, part of that comprehensive workup and medically necessary diagnostic treatment services to eliminate oral or dental infections prior to or along with like organ transplants, cardiovascular replacements, um, valve procedures, chemotherapy, those are things that, um, you know, would be considered along with the medical or the dental services. So as we move on, um, we'll, we'll talk a little further about the inextricable linkage services. So. Dental or oral exams that are part of comprehensive workup prior to a medically necessary diagnostic and treatment service. And, and basically to eliminate an oral or dental infection, um, med medically necessary diagnostic treatments to address dental or oral complications, uh, Medicare covered treatments of the head and of head and neck cancers that are going to be used with radiation or chemo or surgery or any combination of those. There is some coverage also um, for dental ridge reconstruction if that's done as a result of and at the same time as a surgery to remove a tumor. Um, any kind of services to stabilize or immobilize teeth related to reducing a jaw fracture. And dental splints, only when they're used as part of a covered treatment, of a covered medical condition, such as dislocated jaw joints. So payment under Medicare Part A and B um, for ancillary services and supplies. So Medicare payment can also be made under Part A and Part B for the ancillary services and supplies that are incident to the covered dental service. So things like administering anesthesia and diagnostic x-rays, operating room use, and either other, re or other related procedures. And as we talk about these, remember that as um, medical review staff, the things that our medical review staff are going to be looking at and, and determining the payment is where's the linkage? Are these things being done 
because of the medical condition requires the dental procedures and the x-rays are necessary for both the dental procedure and, and the, the medical procedure that has to happen or the medical service that has to happen. So we are gonna look for these things to be linked to the other. Okay, not covered services. We kind of talked about this already. So again, we don't cover items or services for um, the care or treatment, filling, removal, or replacement of teeth or structures that are directly supporting the teeth. Um, the structures listed here that directly supporting the teeth are the periodontum, which includes gingivae, um, dental gingival junction, periodontal membrane, um, cementum, and the alveolar uh, bone or the bone processes and tooth socket. So those things aren't covered. So think of your regular um, dental services, fillings, extractions, um, cleanings, routine cares, um, things like that are just not covered by Medicare. So again, in order for us to pay, we need to see that linkage and why the dental service is necessary for the um, medical service to be successful as well. Okay, we've talked about the inextricably linked dental services quite a bit because that's really the big focus on the dental service and the need for dental service. So again, much like this change, some dental services are so integral to the other medically necessary services that the clinical con success of that service is dependent upon that linkage to the dental service. And I know I've spoke about this a lot so far, and I can't stress how much this is key to supporting the services as being payable by Medicare. Remember, for dental services to be inextricably linked to other Medicare-covered services, different providers like the doctor and the dentist must coordinate care um, in order to, you know, provide that Medicare-covered service to treat the illness and the dental services that are, are integral to the clinical uh, success of the medical service. So without care coordination, healthcare providers wouldn't have the information they need to decide whether the dental service is inextricably linked to the Medicare covered service. If there's no documented evidence to support the exchange of information or um, the integration of it, between the healthcare providers that they've had those discussions that we know we're providing and furnishing the medical services and the dental services because they're, one is necessary for the other. If we can't see those things, if they don't exist, Medicare won't cover and pay for the dental services. So again, examples of care coordination may include referrals, um, exchange of information between medical doctors and dentists. We can find that in progress notes. We can find that in, um, you know, actual referrals sent back and forth, et cetera. We're gonna talk about that more as we move on and talk about the documentation and supporting the services as billed. So to reiterate again, for Medicare to cover the service, there must be an inextricable linkage to the medically necessary other service. So how do you support that in your documentation? The things we're going to look at and the things you must provide us if you have to submit a claim for medical review are 
the office notes or progress notes. From these notes, it should be evident what the plan is for the patient, why the dental services are necessary, any planned interventions, who the interdisciplinary communication needs to be made to, um, which takes us to that interdisciplinary communication. This is where you're gonna find, or we're gonna find, um, the care coordination between the dentist and the doctor. Again, the plan, how the care will be coordinated to provide those medically, Medicare covered services to treat that illness um, and the dental services, you know, that are integral to the success of the medical service. So we really use those interdisciplinary communications to make sure that those discussions are being had and we can see as a medical review entity right away why one service relates to the other. Next, um, we have uh, lab reports and results. So this helps to support the needs for the services should there be, um, should they be part of the overall plan and the care coordination talked about between the physicians? So if there's any um, lab results, if we're looking at infections, if we're, you know, have done any pathology for tumors, et cetera, those are the types of things that we would be looking for. And those are the types of things we would expect those two physicians to talk about in their care coordination. As we move on, next is HMP or history and physical. Now, um, now that you have a medical need um, listed and the coordination of care has started to take place, which is, you know, all of that's in development. The next thing we're going to expect is the history and physical exam of the patient. So this is important, especially for medical clearance. And so both the doctor and the dentist know about any other illnesses, medications, exam findings, et cetera. Anything that could impact that, the success of the dental procedure or the medical procedure. After that, then the procedure is going to take place. So the procedure or operative report must also be submitted, and that's to support the services were billed as they were performed. There again, there must be evidence that the documentation of the procedure, the procedure note or the op report, whichever you want to call it, um, shows exactly what was done why it was done, where it was done, how the patient tolerated the procedure, et cetera. Again, it, it, this all goes back to the evidence of that coordinated care and that the dental service is linked to that medical need. So moving on, so we have um, an office note uh, uh, and that helps us with the reason why those physicians are talking, so we know there's a need for the dental um, and that it's linked to the medical. Any lab reports that got us to this process, we've looked at this patient, we've done a history and physical. Now we've moved on to procedure and op report, so our billing supports exactly what was done. Other things we're gonna look at is medication administration record. What medications were given? Um, were they provided as billed? Were they provided in accordance with Medicare regulations? If there are any kind of um, IVs, oral medications, et cetera, do they follow Medicare standards? And again, that helps us to support your billing and it helps show this overall need. Next, we move on to basically what would be the aftercare portion and the referral information. So referral to the medical doctor for um, after the dental services is provided and, and to show that evidence of that linkage, 
to show that it's substantially related to the medical need and integral to the clinical con uh, success of that medical need. And finally, if you happen to issue an ABN for any reason that you believe Medicare may not pay for all of or a portion of that service for that patient for that day, then you would need to provide us a copy of that as well. So again, we use all of your documentation to um, support the service, to support it as being inextricably linked, to support the medical need, to support the dental need. If there is other documentation in your notes that is not shown on this screen, but you believe it helps support the medical necessity of the service, then we do highly encourage you to submit that documentation as well. So moving on, we're going to start talking about some of the medical review findings that our medical review department has um, seen while they are reviewing some of our dental service. Um, these are, a lot of these are just basic billing issues. And although we're really focusing on the clinical coverage criteria, the documentation, et cetera, you'll see how these billing issues also can relate right back to those documentation and clinical coverage issues. So first is just billing for statutorily excluded services. Statutorily excluded services are those things that we discussed back on um, the slide that was listed, not covered dental and not covered dental services. Sorry, I'm tongue tied today. So these items um, and services include things like treatment um, for fillings or removal or replacement of teeth or structures that directly support the teeth, uh, you know, those type of things. Routine dental care, extractions of impacted teeth, um, dental services performed in connection with excluded services, like preparing the mouth for dentures. So this is why I've stressed so much thus far that there must be that documented linkage, that it has to be evident in the documentation. If we only see extraction of teeth and we can't find the linkage to the medically necessary other service, it's probably going to end up in denial. So next is billing for not otherwise classified codes. When there are actual applicable dental codes that could be used. So when you are billing the service or a procedure, you need to select the CPT or HICS-PICS codes or CDT codes that accurately identifies the service or the procedure that you're going to perform or that you did perform. If no such code exists, then you would report the service or procedure using the appropriate unlisted or not otherwise classified code, which often ends in a 9-9. Um, we will not correctly code an unlisted procedure or not otherwise classified code when there is a valid code available. So it is the responsibility of the provider to ensure all information required to process an unlisted procedure or not otherwise classified code is included on the claim form. And to use the not otherwise classified code, you must have a concise description of the service or procedure rendered within your documentation. And it also needs to be placed in, um, on your, your CMS 1500 or electronic equivalent. And there's an 80 character space limit, and that is an item 19. Finally, 
no diagnosis record, uh, code reported on the claim. So if there's no diagnosis code reported, the claim won't process. This is more of a claims processing issue than a medical review issue, but it's still going to result in an error. So the proper coding is necessary on Medicare claims because codes are generally used to determine coverage and payment amounts. On inpatient claims, providers must report a principal diagnosis. And the principal diagnosis is a condition after um, that, that's established after the study to be the chief responsible issue for that patient's admission. For outpatient claims, providers report the full diagnosis code for the diagnosis shown to be chiefly responsible for that outpatient service. So this may actually be a symptom if a definitive diagnosis has not been made or it could be the actual definitive diagnosis. So again, you can see how um, the documentation has to support the services and a lack of documentation could result in coding issues. So if we have no documentation of the patient's actual diagnosis on the bill, but it is contained within the documentation, um, that's going to be a problem because your code, your claim is not going to process. It's just going to reject. Um, if you, if your billers throw a not otherwise classified diagnoses or codes on the claim, but there is a code that is specific and is evident in your documentation, could also result in a denial of service. So make sure that your documentation and what you're providing your billing and coding personnel is as accurate as possible so your claims can process appropriately. So there are a few identified billing challenges that I want to talk about. Um, so we've discovered some billing challenges from our dental providers. And the first is just being unsure how to enroll in Medicare so that you can bill. And unsure of where to start um, the billing, you know, once you are enrolled. Um, another is unsure how to submit a claim. The good thing is all of these issues are listed on the CMS Medicare dental coverage page. And give me just a second and I am going to use the link that is here and I'm gonna show you where you can find this information. So hang on for just a second. All right, so hopefully the website is up and visible now. And down here, this is basically um, right from cms.gov and, and the easiest way to get there is just to do a search and use the keyword dental and it's gonna take you to the Medicare dental coverage page. And here, down here in the bottom, is where you can find those various issues that we talked about. Um, who can enroll in Medicare? Where can I enroll? How, how do I enroll? You enroll with your MAC, and we are your MAC, um, but all the additional information that is needed, the forms that you need to submit, that you need to fill out, are all listed right here for you. So again, as I scroll up, and I'll just give you a quick example, and I'm gonna type dental and Medicare dental coverage, and that's gonna take me to that page. So a really quick, easy search, and you don't have to try to go through and find out which um, section of the Medicare website that that is in. All right. So as we move on, let's talk a little bit about the proper code reporting. 
So you want to submit claims using the institutional or the professional claim forms at this time. Use the appropriate CDT, the current dental terminology, or the CPT, which is the current procedural terminology codes for the services that you provide. When you submit a claim for Medicare covered dental and, uh, services, you're actually certifying that the dental service is inextricably linked to the Medicare covered medical service. If you're submitting a Medicare claim for denial, so you can get paid by a third party payer like Medicaid, you're, you're going to want to include the appropriate um, CPT Hicks Picks code modifiers to certify that you believe Medicare shouldn't pay the claim. So let's recap. So we went through a lot of information today um, and talked about a little bit about the coverage of the services. So we could talk more about what kinds of denials we've um, experienced. And um, we talked a lot about the documentation requirements. So the dental coverage and all of this information was really to help you avoid medical review denials. Um, please refer back to those documentation requirements and those highlighted identified billing issues. That's going to help you to ensure that, you know, you are coding things properly. All right, so before we move on and see if there's any questions from any providers. I want to take some time to go over a few pre-submitted questions that we received that, um, uh, you know, I want to make sure people know about. So there was one question that came in and the, the person that asked the question was wanting more specific information on the new dental rehab code, which is G0330. Now, honestly, um, I don't know much about this code, but I'm gonna have Jennifer put a link to the um, ASC code updates for 2024 in the chat. Now that MLN that she just put in the chat contains information about the use of that code. What I do know is that it only describes facility services for covered dental rehab procedures provided to a patient requiring monitored anesthesia. So general anesthesia, IV sedation, mon uh, monitored anesthesia care, and the use of an operating room. If it's used for technical facility free component of the dental rehab, uh, it is used, I'm sorry, for the technical facility free component of the dental rehab services only. So again, the MLN is also um, has a bunch of information that I'll route you actually to the 2024 OPPS ASB final rule where you can learn about other dental codes that have been added. And I believe there were 104 dental codes that were added to the ASC payment system for 2024. So you'll wanna pay attention to the ASC payment indicators um, for these new codes when using them as well. The next question we received was regarding the eight 37D, which is the claim form that's specific to dental. So this question um, was actually if we are accepting bills on the 837D yet. And the answer to that is no. It looks like from the research I've done um, that this may be happening early in 2024. So again, it's still a work in pro uh, progress. So until that time, you would continue to bill on the institutional claims, the 837I or 
CMS 1450 or the professional 837P or CMS 1500 form or, you know, their electronic equivalent. So at this time, I'm going to pause and ask Jennifer if any questions have come in. No, there's a, no questions in the chat right now. Thank you. All right. Well, on behalf of myself and all provider outreach and education, as well as our medical review department, I want to thank you for investing your time in our webinar today and taking interest in our educational event. I hope you have a very safe and healthy new year. And at this time, you may now disconnect.